delve a little bit deeper, not have to spend too much time on the basics, and spend a little bit more time on the cases. Uh, oh, I just want to make a plug for the BCSC. So I I, for the last couple of years, I've volunteered for the American Board of Ophthalmology, so I write neuro-ophthalmology questions for the board exam. And occasionally they ask me to write OCAP questions. When I write an OCAP question, like, because I'm like, they have like this online thing where you like put in the stem and then put in the correct answer and the distractors. And then at the bottom, I have to put the exact page in the BCSC where you can find that answer. So in other words, every question that I write for the OCAP exam has to come right out of the BCSC. So um, there are some parts of the BCSC that are terrific, there are some that are less terrific, but if you want to do well on the OCAP, it's, it's in there somewhere. Every question on the OCAP comes directly out of that book. It doesn't come from any other source. <laughs> so um, uh, I just want to review the uh, anatomy really quick. We'll talk about the pharmacology really quick, and then talk about some exam techniques, and then move on. So the, uh, the pupillary sphincter muscle is innervated by the Edinger-Westphal nucleus up here in the midbrain, and those pupillary fibers, those, that afferent limb, runs through the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3. It synapses in the ciliary ganglion, which becomes important when you're talking about Aedes pupil, and then it runs through the short ciliary nerve and eventually ends up as a acetylcholine uh, um, neuromuscular junction at the pupillary sphincter. Very easy, very straightforward pathway, just two neurons. The dilator muscle, which is innervated by the sympathetic pathway, has a much more uh, convoluted pathway. It starts up, you know, up here in the thalamus somewhere, runs through the hypothalamus, through the midbrain, all the way down your spinal cord to the very bottom of your uh, the spinal um, cord in the um, cervical spine, and it synapses here at the ciliospinal center of budge, which is between C8 and T1, and then it sends a second order neuron up over the top of the lung uh, into your neck, where it hits the superior cervical ganglion, it synapses again. And then the third order neuron runs right along the carotid artery up into the cavernous sinus where it hops briefly onto V1. And uh, it also runs on six, actually for a short period of time. So if you ever have a Horner syndrome associated with uh, ipsilateral uh, V1 numbness or a six nerve palsy, that's highly localizing. And then it runs through the long ciliary nerve uh, as an adrenergic uh, receptor onto the dilator muscle. So you've got the uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation of the iris. And this is, this is bread and butter OCAP stuff. So in terms of pharmacology, there are about five drops that you should know about. Uh, cocaine blocks uh, reuptake of norepinephrine. We'll talk about that in a minute. Apiclonidine. I always forget. It's like an alpha one. It's a weak alpha one agonist or something. And um, because cocaine is just so hard, so much harder to get your hands on, it's becoming the more popular eye drop for confirming the Horner's uh, syndrome. Uh, you need to know about both of these. Hydroxyamphetamine used to be used to localize a Horner's because it, um, uh, it causes release of norepinephrine at the neuromuscular junction, uh, but because it's no longer commercially available, it's kind of falling off of the tests. It's still mentioned in the BCSC for historical reasons. I imagine one day it'll go away. We sometimes use dilute and stronger concentrations of pilocarpine. Uh, we use the dilute solution to confirm the presence of an 80s pupil, and we use 1% if we think somebody might have a pharmacologic madriasis. So in other words, like if you're trying to differentiate a big pupil, and you're like, hmm, I wonder if this could be like part of a third nerve palsy, or could it be that they, you know, were wearing a scopolamine patch, you know, on their cruise and got some of that in their eye? Well, if you put 1% pilocarpine in that eye, if it constricts, then you have to start thinking about a third nerve palsy. 
But if it doesn't constrict, then that rules out a third nerve palsy, right? Uh, a big pupil from a third nerve palsy will react to pyocarbine. One percent. And then phenylephrine, we're sometimes, we sometimes use that if a pupil doesn't dilate well, like let's say that, that you know, we're worried about a small pupil like Horner's, or maybe you're worried that somebody put some, uh, you know, this would be uncommon, but got some sort of a, uh, a um, uh, something a meiotic in their eye, you could, uh, you could use phenylephrine. Uh, so if it's a pharmacologic uh, thing, phenylephrine's not going to dilate the pupil like it does in clinic when we're dilating people for a dilated exam. Um, or if it's like mechanically a small pupil because of synechia or because it's been traumatized, it won't react to phenylephrine. But uh, if you if you like pharmacologically uh, dial or constrict the pyocardium, won't it react to phenylephrine? At least I've seen that like in my patient, or one of my patients. If you so if you have a pupil that's small from pyocardium, will it dilate to phenylephrine? Yeah. It it depends on how strong the concentration is of the pyocardium and and how long ago it was put in. Yeah, it can be confusing, and that's why sometimes you have to wait a couple of days and look at the pupils again. Uh, whenever you're doing any pharmacologic testing, you want to put the drops in both pupils because then the normal pupil acts as a control. <clears throat> we just had a case the other day where it was either Dr. C, I think it was Dr. C or Dr. Crum, one of them, had what looked like for sure a Horner syndrome, and they put cocaine in both eyes, and neither pupil dilated. So they knew that the cocaine was bad, and they, had, and they knew they had to start over. And then you always want to, you, you never want to like sit there with your little um, pupil card before and after drops trying to figure out how much anisocoria is there is. You really need to take some photographs and, and really and, me and measure carefully. So just briefly about the pharmacology of cocaine. So there's always at the, so this, now we're talking about um, that neuromuscular junction between the third order neuron and the dilator muscle, that adrenergic receptor. So this is a big picture of that now. Uh, so here's the third order neuron, and here's the dilator muscle that has little, you know, norepinephrine receptors on it. And there's always a basal release of norepinephrine, and that norepinephrine is always being sucked out of the neuromuscular junction. This just, the, the reason that our bodies do this is to make that receptor just much more quick to respond. It works faster if there's always this little basal release of norepinephrine and then always this little bit of reuptake. So when the nerve fires, like all of a sudden a lot of norepinephrine is able to come out and actually cause um, the dilator muscle to respond. Uh, if you put cocaine on that neuromuscular junction as an eye drop, the reuptake of norepinephrine is blocked, and so that little basal release of norepinephrine that's constantly going on, all of a sudden a lot of cocaine, I'm sorry, norepinephrine builds up in the junction, and these receptors get activated and the dilator muscle contracts uh, to open up the pupil. So here's an example of somebody with a Horner syndrome. They've got a small pupil on the left, and a little bit of ptosis. Remember the ptosis that's, that you associate with Horner's syndrome is just a millimeter or two. It's not like a down, like a full out ptosis like you see in a third nerve palsy. It's just a couple of millimeters. Because it's only the Mueller's muscle that's not working. The levator is still working. Okay, so then they put in some cocaine eye drops and then 30, 40 minutes later, the normal right pupil has dilated as it should because of this action. But the left pupil hasn't moved. So there's much more anisocoria after uh, cocaine than there was before cocaine. And the cutoff is a millimeter for a positive Horner syndrome. If there's more than one millimeter of anisocoria after cocaine, that's a positive cocaine test. And this person has a, uh, I think this is a ganglioneuroma uh, of their chest. So the, the, the second order neuron, the one that we would associate with a Pankos tumor, is being uh, uh, blocked by um, uh, by this tumor, or it's been damaged by this tumor. Which brings up another point. A Horner syndrome 
by itself is not important. Like, it doesn't affect your vision. Uh, cosmetically, it's only a little bit of ptosis. Your pupil's a little bit small. So what? Like, it really doesn't affect your eye or your vision. The thing that's important about the Horner syndrome is it's a sign of, it's potentially a sign of something bad. That's why they make such a big fuss about it. Uh, we're going to talk really briefly about the pharmacologic action of hydroxyamphetamine. And uh, so uh, this is an eye drop that we sometimes use to localize a Horner syndrome to tell if it's a third or a second order Horner's. So the pharmacology of hydroxyamphetamine is to cause the release of norepinephrine into the neuromuscular junction. It doesn't depend on that slow basal release of norepinephrine to work like cocaine does. So when you, so this is the normal junction, there's nothing happening, uh, and we're looking at that same neuromuscular junction between the third order sympathetic neuron and the dilator muscle of the pupil. When you dump on hydroxyamphetamine, if this neuron is alive <coughs> at all, then all the norepinephrine at the synapse will be dumped out into the neuromuscular junction and will cause the dilator muscle to contract. So nor in a normal pupil, it will dilate to hydroxyamphetamine. Okay, so here's another patient with a left-sided Horner's. Uh, they've got a smallish pupil on the left, and again, a little bit of ptosis, not a lot. Um, just, just out of curiosity, let me look back here for a second. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot, this is kind of an important point. Um, so this was our previous case. We were doing cocaine testing in the patient with the ganglioneuroma of the thorax. Notice that not only is the upper lid a little bit totic, but the lower lid is up just a little bit compared to the right one, so that the palpebral fissure is a little bit smaller. And, and that's because there are some sympathetically innervated uh, muscle fibers in the lower lid retractors, which become important when you're doing strabismus surgery, uh, the, to avoid them. Um, uh, so you'll sometimes have what we call upside down ptosis, which means the lower lid will sometimes be up a little bit. Okay, that didn't happen in this, well, maybe there, no, not in this particular case, you know, I'd say the eyes are pretty symmetric. I don't really see a lot of upside down ptosis, but definitely some ptosis of the upper lid. Then they put on hydroxyamphetamine and both pupils dilate. That tells you that this third order neuron is working so that there's not a problem, at least between the superior cervical <coughs> ganglion and the eye. That, that, that pathway is, is working. It's either the first or the second order neuron that's broken, causing this Horner syndrome. And in this case, this is a very a similar tumor. Uh, I can't, I think I wrote myself a note about what this is. Oh yeah, this is, a, uh, this is metastatic breast cancer with infiltration of the pleura. Uh, by metastatic breast cancer, and that's a damage to the second order neuron causing a second order Horner syndrome. So again, the Horner's by itself, not important. Sign of something else bad, that's important. And that's in general another principle about OCAPS is that if, you, if you're like reading your BCSC and you see something that is associated with a systemic disease, then man, write that down because that's another thing that's strongly emphasized is systemic diseases with ophthalmic manifestations. So, systemic disease, ophthalmic manifestation. It's important. Um, so, if you have somebody that's coming in with, um, uh, that's complaining about anisocoria or, or oftentimes sent to you by another physician, because of anisocoria, you want to know if they've had any previous surgery or trauma, not only to the eyes or the orbit, but also like maybe to the neck. Um, sometimes insertion of a, a central line, you know, up here near, in the, near the uh, subclavian can give you a Horner syndrome. So anything that's happened around the head or neck. Uh, old photos are super helpful because sometimes people don't notice that they have some anisocoria. Somebody points it out to them, either a coworker or a friend or a family member or a doctor, you know, like a, maybe a primary care doctor, and then they're like, oh shit, when did that you know, happen? And so uh, sometimes it's been there for years, and like if it's, like let's say they have something that sort of looks like a Horner's, but it's been there for 10 years, it, who cares? Like, it, don't worry about it. 
So old photos can be super helpful. And then any history of previous intraocular inflammation, like somebody that's had a, a herpetic uveitis or anything like that, that can damage the dilator and the sphincter muscle and, and cause some anisocoria. Um, you want to measure the pupils and, you know, just figuring out which pupil is abnormal is actually a little bit more challenging than it would seem. And I know DR went over this in his video, but you just want to measure the pupils in dim illumination and bright light. You want to look at their near response. And of course, you ought, just as, as part of your normal exam, you look for an APD. And then the next thing that I do after I measure somebody's pupils in clinic is I put them behind the slit lamp microscope because you can see sphincter palsies, you can see transillumination defects from previous, either like from pigment dispersion syndrome, which is a, a cause of anisocoria, previous in, uh, inflammation can you know, sometimes leave some transillumination defects, maybe a, a, a rough cataract surgery, you know, where there was like a, a floppy iris syndrome and the, and the dilator muscle got boogered up, you know, during the cataract surgery. Those will show up as transillumination defects. Um, <clears throat> you can look for other rare stuff like an ice syndrome or something like that that could cause the pupils to be a different size. Um, so when you measure pupils in the dark, uh, what I do is I take a Finhoff transilluminator and I sort of shine it up. I, ha I, have a, I have my lamp at the ready up here, but it's turned off currently in this picture. I use my transilluminator and shine light sort of up the patient's nose just to get a little bit of light in the, into the eye so that I can see what I'm doing in the dark. Then you flip that light on and you can see the pupils constrict, and then you can flip it back off and, you know, watch them dilate, right? Look for a dilation lag. Uh, this is funny. So this, this is Stan Thompson. He, he's a retired neuro-ophthalmologist where I trained at Iowa, and he always found that using money as a near target was a much more effective <laughs> than, 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 like, just, say, looking at my, look at my finger or look at the tip of my pen or whatever. <laughs> And you can see that her pupils really, yeah, wow, great near response. Uh, so at the slit lamp, you want to make sure the dilator and sphincter muscles are working. Look for segmental palsies and look for idiopathic stuff like synechia, pigment dispersion syndrome, eye syndrome. Oh, if somebody has congenital anterior segment dysgenesis, this would be a, uh, a rare cause of anisocoria. Anything that boogers up the iris, the dilator, the sphincter. So you want to make sure that all four, there's four iris muscles, two in each eye, so you want to make sure they're all working. If the pupil won't dilate, then something's wrong with the dilator muscle or its innervation. If the pupil won't constrict, then something's wrong with the sphincter muscle or its innervation. If you just kind of think of it logically like that, it kind of helps, but sometimes it makes it easier. Okay, so if you have an anisocoria that's greatest in the light, that tells you that it's the big pupil that's not working. And so the major differential would be, you can just shout them out, third nerve palsy, Jeez. 80 pupil, uh, sonic metrosis. Great. Uh, the other thing that I wrote down was angle closure. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully you'd be able to figure that out without doing a lot of pharmacologic testing. Uh, okay, so yeah, those are the big ones, third nerve and 80s. Oh, trauma. Another common cause, somebody that's had a blunt trauma to the eye. I don't know why, but I think the sphincter muscle is more easily damaged. So generally, somebody that's had an eye trauma, if it's going to damage the pupil, it's usually a big pupil. And I score that's greatest in the dark. That means the dilator muscle of the small pupil is broken. So, of course, that's a Horner syndrome. Uh, uh, diabetics so can sometimes have a small pupil that doesn't dilate very well, but usually that's symmetric. Um, uh, somebody that's using, let's see, yeah, this one's crazy in the dark. Uh, oh, brimonidine, like, like say somebody's just using brimonidine in one eye for their unilateral glaucoma. That'll make a smallish pupil. Uh, sometimes an 80s pupil which usually starts out as a big, poorly reactive pupil over like five to 10 years, will sometimes become a small, poorly reactive pupil. So that sometimes 
will give you anisocoria that's greatest in the dark. But you should be able to take that person right to the slit lamp, look, find those segmental palsies, and you're done. Um, if you have an awake ambulatory patient and they've got a big pupil and everybody's like, you know, pooping in their pants about a third nerve palsy, there's got to be an associated motility deficit, okay? So if you've got somebody with a big pupil and their lid is good and their motility is good, they don't have diplopia, it's, it's got to be something like benign episodic pedriasis or an 80s or pharmacologic. You can just, just cross that off your list. And if, you, and if you're worried, like I said, you can take a drop of um, pilocarpine. And, if, and, and my bet is that the pilocarpine is not going to do anything. Uh, always remember to look for aberrant re of the pupil. So sometimes if, if, you, if you have somebody with a compressive third nerve palsy, you can, again, you can watch them at the slit lamp when they look right, left, up, and down. And if you see the, the classic one is that when somebody looks toward their nose, when they adduct their eye, the pupil constricts. So if you see that, uh, then you, you, you know that there might be a, a compressive lesion of the third nerve palsy that's caused aberrant re of the pupil. Now, some of the fibers that were supposed to go to the medial rectus muscle have been misdirected to the sphincter. Um, DR covered 80s pupil in his lecture. It's like this is completely unimportant except that you don't want to confuse it with something else. And so that's why we talk about it. You don't want to mix it up with a third nerve palsy and start getting MRIs and stuff like that. So, and it's pretty common. So because it's common and because you, you want to not go down the pathway of thinking it's something more uh, worrisome, that's why it's, it's so strongly emphasized. Uh, the cholinergic supersensitivity takes a few days to occur, so if you see somebody with an acute 80s, which is pretty uncommon to see that in clinic, they might not react to dilute pilocarpine. Uh, and the effect, you have to wait like 45 to 60 minutes to, to see the full effect. So you have to put in the dilute pilocarpine in both eyes and send the patient off to do something for an hour and then bring them back. Okay, so now I want to show you a video. <clears throat> so this is in the novel collection, the Neuro-Ophthalmology Virtual Education Library. Skip ahead a little bit. And let's see what happens with the segments around it. But here we're asking the patient to perform a near response pretty much from 1 30 to 2 o'clock. Um, pretty quiet. See that? that? Now look at that segment around 2 to 4 o'clock. It contracts, but pretty slowly. The rest of the pupil is pretty quiet. See that? Okay. That's fairly... Did everybody see that? So when they turn the lights on, like this part of the sphincter constricted, you can see like the iris stroma sort of streaming in toward each itself. The whole rest of the people did nothing. Okay, I'm going to watch that again. Yeah, this is compared to the right eye. Lights off. That's Lights a on. dramatic sector policy extending pretty much from 1.30 to 2 o'clock all the way around the pupil to about six to seven o'clock. Lights off. Oh, Again, a what blink. you can see is the iris folding in around two to three o'clock, and maybe four o'clock. Those are active segments that are contracting, although not normally, but the rest of the iris is pretty quiet. There's a good one. I think it shows up very well here. <coughs> Focus. So, uh, uh, and that's, that's something you just, like, if you just uh, Google novel, N-O-V-E-L, uh, sphincter palsy, 80s pupil, like, this URL will pop right up. Okay, so that, if you see that, like, nothing else does that. Like, if you see that at the slit lamp, you're done. Uh, you could do the pharmacologic testing if you want to, for fun. But 
but like uh, I wouldn't, or I don't anymore anyway. Or unless I have like a bunch of residents with me, I'll sometimes do it for fun to, you know, just as a demo. But um, if you see those sphincter palsies, that's pathic mnemonic. Yeah, a big dorsal midbrain correctopia or something. Dorsal midbrain syndrome is going to have other uh, signs or symptoms with it. They're going to have eyelid retraction. They're going to have a light near dissociation, just like an eighties. They're going to have uh, usually an up gaze deficit, and they're going to have uh, convergence retraction that stack. So, yeah, if you see those other things, then, yeah, obviously. I've actually never, I've, I don't know if you get segmental denervation. Like, I've never taken a paranoids patient and, and looked at them closely at the slit lamp. They for sure have a light near dissociation. Their near response is stronger than their light response. But I don't think they have segmental palsies like this. Traumatic um, hydriasis. Do you have? Can you have sectoral trauma, or is it usually just the whole muscle? Um, you you usually uh, you might have some sec. My experience is that like the whole thing doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the whole thing's broken. Um, and again, you're going to have that history of trauma that is going to clue you into why somebody looks like this. But like I'm trying to think, like when I've taken somebody with a traumatic medriasis at the slit lamp, it seems to me like the whole thing is just like dead in the water. It's not segmental like this, because it's the reinnervation that, like in a traumatic big pupil, it's because the sphincter muscle has been physically damaged, whereas the seg segmental constriction that you see in an 80s syndrome is because of reinnervation. The nerve got damaged and then it reinnervated. So the pathophysiology is. And so I, I don't think you would see this with traumatic addresses. Great questions. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is there any way to diagnose that? If you see in the fixed dilated people, pharmacologically dilated pupils are that comes up with some regularity. Um, I don't see a lot of like cocaine users get it in their eye, but sometimes ENT, you know, I know definitely once when I was a resident, I was seeing a trauma patient on call that was um, like on a ventilator, like they were asleep and the nurses got freaked out because they had a dilated pupil and it took me like most of that night to figure out that ENT had been there right before me and had shot some cocaine up their nose so that they could look at their sinuses. Yeah, so that, that can happen. Um, epinephrine, phenylephrine, uh, you know, anybody that like works in a pharmacy, you know, you want to, or a nurse, anything like that, you want to definitely ask them about what they've been, what any drugs they've been handling. Um, scopolamine is another common one. Oh, a new one that I just learned about in the last couple years is glycopyrrolate. So glycopyrrolate is a, I want to say it's a parasympatholytic. And some people use it for uh, hyperhidrosis. It's like a topical cream. They can, I think they rub it on their hands. I don't know if they put it in their armpits, maybe. And anyway, you get that in your eye and that'll dilate your pupil too. But far and away, like in, not in my neuro clinic, but in my general clinic, the most common reason, the most common diagnosis that I make when somebody comes in with a chief complaint of anisocoria is benign metriasis. This is a very common thing. Um, it's more common in patients with migraine. It's, it's, it's unilateral. Uh, it looks freaky. Patients are usually asymptomatic. It's usually pointed out to them by a friend, coworker, family member. They're like, what the hell's wrong with your eye? And they look in their mirror and they're like, oh my God. If you're lucky, they take a picture of it. But they take a selfie because when they come to see you, their pupils should be absolutely normal. No anisocoria, normal light reaction, normal dilation. Uh, traumatic medriasis, again, makes a fixed dilated pupil. And siderosis, uh, very uncommon these days, but uh, you know, every now and then somebody gets a foreign body in their eye that gets not diagnosed, and, and, and after a while they start getting not only a retinopathy but also a, a big poorly reactive pupil. Oh, already, well, we already talked about that. 
oh, there's this thing called tadpole pupil that might be a variant of benign episodic medriasis, which is way less common, but it's sort of like a segmental uh, uh, um, it's like a segmental benign medriasis, and I just have a quick picture of it that I brought up. Here's a patient coming in, you know, with a complaint of anisocoria. At the time they present, their pupils are totally normal, but they took this selfie. And so here's the patient in clinic. You know, they've got normal, symmetric pupils. And here's the selfie. And so this just that turns that's kind of like a typical benign episodic medriasis. You know, their motility is normal, their eyelid is normal, uh, they don't have any double vision during the spell, right? It's all it is is a big pupil. Isolated big pupil. You get blurry vision with that big pupil. A little tiny bit, but you, you but because they've got both eyes open, they're usually not, you know, unless they have amblyopia or something, they're not symptomatic. Uh, this one's from novel. So this, so this is like a seg. So some people think that benign episodic medriasis is the dilator muscle on one eye just gets activated somehow. So if you have a segmental activation, you can get this funny kind of tadpole shape to the pupil. And again, having a selfie is super, uh, super helpful. In my experience, this is way, this is like 20 times less common than just benign episodic medriasis. So if you if you think somebody might have got something in your their eye, two percent's kind of that kind of hurts. I would just use one percent. So a pharmacologically dilated pupil will not constrict, or it might constrict just a little bit if somebody like got scopolamine in their eye or glycopyrrolate or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> um, again, like how much they got in their eye and how long ago they got it in their eye is going to depend on how much constriction you get from pilocarbine. <clears throat> uh, but remember to test both eyes. Don't forget about physiologic anisocoria. Um, DR talked about that in his lecture. Horner syndrome, DR talked about a lot in his lecture. The one thing I do want to show you is an example of um, uh, dilation lag. Yeah, this is on the novel website. Next example, we'll be showing the dilation lag, typical of a Horner syndrome. The lights are now turned. So this is an infrared camera, so that's why you can see what's going on in the dark. Um, they they use some prisms on the um, video camera, so that both eyes are right next to each other. It's just a lot easier to see what's happening that way. But that's why the video looks funny. But the right eye is over here, and the left eye is over there, just like if you were facing the patient, and they've just like. You know, taking out their mid face to put the eyes together so you, can, so you can watch them simultaneously, which is super helpful. So you can see this person has a small pupil on the left. They have just a tiny bit of ptosis, maybe. And you'll see that when they turn the lights off, that the right pupil you know, springs open, goes, and that's a normal pupil. It should be completely dilated within five seconds. And the, the Horner's pupils are, like it dilates, but it's just it's super slow. Top, and you can see the right pupil dilates quite fast relative to the left. Normal pupil should dilate about five seconds. Sympathetic defect in 
the left eye, you can see that it takes quite a bit longer for that pupil so to do it again. <clears throat> Another example, lights on, lights off. Notice how that right pupil springs to life, and that left pupil just sort of lags behind. It takes about 10, 15 seconds to catch up. And that's a nice way to document a Horner syndrome. Here it is, lights are on. Now with the lights off, see that right pupil just spring to life? And slowly that left pupil will catch up. You can also document this by taking still photographs. For example, in darkness, take a photograph of 5 seconds and 15 seconds and compare the degree of anisocoria. Okay, so this is a different patient. Uh, now the Horner's is on the right. You see we have a small pupil, a little bit of ptosis on the right. Here's another example. You can see how that left pupil just sort of springs right up. The right pupil takes a while to catch up. Lights back on. Notice how the noise adds to the sympathetic drive and accentuates the initial anisocoria. So that's something I'll sometimes do in clinic. So I'll, I'll warn the patient ahead of time, okay, when I turn the lights on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell at you. And then that really drives the sympathetic system big, even though they know that you're going to do it. And so a normal pupil will, like, really spring open very quickly, and that and the, and then the Horner's pupil just doesn't, it just, it just takes its sweet time. Lights back on. I'm just playing it over. Noise <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> adds to the sympathetic drive and accentuates the initial anisocoria. Oh, this is an example of uh, aperclonidine testing. Uh, so this is somebody, you know, like, uh, who has a pretty good Horner's going on over there on the left, very droopy lid, uh, small pupil, and they've been giving aperclonidine. You can use half percent. I'd prefer to use one percent. And I think you wait like, I want to say you have to wait like 45 minutes to get the full effect, but you notice that the anisocoria is now reversed in the bottom photos. So after aperclonidine, now the right pupil is a small pupil, and you notice that the lids come up too, which is a nice, uh, again, you always want to take pictures, but with the aperclonidine makes the lid come up and reverses the anisocoria. That's a positive aperclonidine test. Uh, oh, it's time to break up into groups. Okay, so let's do two groups. Like, how about like you? Two sides. Let's two sides of the table. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Drug with its pharmacological characteristics. Oh. So, what's like a speed? Right? Yeah. Uh, 
something like that. So it should be release. Yeah, it's release. Which one were you on? It's three. It's the... Yeah, it's four. So it's... No, I don't should be... Sensation of dying, yeah. Because <laughs> you're like, a hard kill them. So they're right. <laughs> sympathetic drug like epinephrine. Okay, Team South, what does cocaine do? Um, Lots of reuptake. So D. Yes, D. Okay, Team North, hydroxyamphetamine. A. Causes release of norepinephrine in the neuromuscular junction. Pilot Carpe, Team South. Sympathomimetic. Sympathomimetic, it mimics the effect of, a, of like acetylcholine. And then Team North, atropine. The only one that's left is a parasympathetic, right? It blocks the effect of acetylcholine. Why does atropine dilate? Because uh, there's always a basal release of acetylcholine at the sphincter muscle. And so when you block that, the, 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 the so there's, there's our, our neuromuscular junctions are all like this. So there's always a little bit of acetylcholine being released at the dilator, at the sphincter muscle. There's always a little bit of norepinephrine being released at the dilator muscle. And those things are in balance so that your pupil has a normal size. If you block the effect of acetylcholine at the sphincter neuromuscular junction, then over time the norepinephrine takes over and the pupil dilates. And it also, of course, eliminates the light reaction. You know? So if, you're, if you shine a light in somebody's eye with atropine, their third nerve fires, but nothing happens because the acetylcholine has been blocked. Team South. Yeah, so a, a fresh 80s will not, you know, shouldn't, um, I think. A, a fresh 80s will react to pilocarpine, but it does not have the, it has not developed the super sensitivity. Um, so a fresh 80s, you know, one that has not had time to develop that uh, aberrant re -innervation, Will will still react to pilocarpine. So this could 
So nothing, so application pilot card goes no. So this could not be a fresh 80. So this would be false. Uh, team North. True. True, that's the big one. Team, team South. False. Correct. A third nerve palsy will still react to pilot card because there's nothing wrong with the sphincter. There's nothing wrong with the neuromuscular junction at the, at the, at the uh, sphincter. And then where are we? Team North. True. True. Yeah, traumatic madriasis, the, the muscle is physically broken, so you can pour on as much pilocarpine as you want, that it's not going to get stricken. Uh, we'll just do this one together so we can move on. Okay, so, um, so 80s pupil is the classic uh, thing that's associated with the light near dissociation. Paranoid syndrome, as Marshall mentioned, has a light near dissociation. Physiologic anisocoria should have the same light and near response. That's something that distinguishes a physiologic anisocoria from these other things. Neurosyphilis, that is a really, like I've never seen that cause um, small, poorly reactive pupils, but um, uh, but it get, it's still in the books, and there's a lot of syphilis running around, and so you still need to be aware of it. Uh, that does cause a light near dissociation of those of the pupils. Yeah. So the answer is B. All these the, all these other three things cause a light near dissociation. We'll do this one together. So this person has a positive cocaine test because they've got more than one millimeter of anisocoria following cocaine. Okay, so uh, Team North, why would you do a hydroxyamphetamine test? To localize the lesion. Good. Team South, why would you do an MRI of the brain and your neck with contrast? Because it looks positive mortars and you yeah, find exactly. what's causing it. Uh, team North, why would you do this? This is a hard one. So the reason you do this is like you want to make sure that this isn't just like a small crappy pupil that's always been a small crappy pupil. So if you put phenylephrine in there and the pupil doesn't dilate, all of a sudden you're not so worried about a co about a uh, corners. It's because it just means their dilator muscle is busted from some other cause. Uh, team salt. <laughs> So could, yeah, be congenital. Congenital. could be congenital, could be old. <laughs> right. So if you have a positive cocaine test, but it's been there for five years, it's not a metastatic breast cancer. It's not a ganglioneuroma. It might have been a carotid dissection five years ago. You're not going to do anything about that. So an old corners is, you don't, you really don't have to evaluate it. Nobody faults you for getting an MRI, but uh, I probably would. Oh, here's a great case. Okay, so really put on your thinking caps. You're going to work together in your little groups. Okay, so here's some, so this is a woman that's had variable anisocoria. She's, she's, when she comes in, her pupils are normal. They're symmetric. They react to light. They dilate. She has no motility deficit. She has no... Uh, Light near dissociation, she has no ptosis, her, her exam is normal. She does have migraines. Here's some selfies that she took of herself. So here's one where it's a sunny day, uh, but both of her pupils are big, inappropriately. Here's another day where the right pupil's big and the left pupil's small. And then here's another day where the right pupil is big and the left pupil is small. She uses a glycopyrrolate. Yes. Exactly. <clears throat> is that it? Wait, is it really? Yeah. Okay. 
So she comes in three weeks later. Her, both pupils are gigantic, non-reactive to light. And so you put in pilocarpine, and they don't move. So somebody with benign episodic medriasis, first of all, that's usually unilateral. Matter of fact, that's in the name, benign episodic unilateral medriasis. So if you have somebody that's got bilateral medriasis, that's sort of off the, I'm sure it's possible, but it's pretty much off the menu. And in that case, you really want to think more about pharmacologic. I don't know, if somebody has benign episodic medriasis and they come into your clinic while they're symptomatic, mm -hmm. I can't remember if their pupil will react or not. It might react just very sluggishly. Uh, so it'd be hard <clears throat> in clinic to differentiate it from a pharmacologic. But if you've got somebody with both pupils are big and neither of them respond to um, pilocarpine, you've got, it's got to be pharmacologic. And in this case, this patient was using glyc glycopyrrolate. Okay, here's another. Put on your thinking caps. <laughs> I mean, he gave us the hint earlier, though. So I did. I don't know if it really counts. It's all good. Fantastic. So I hear you guys already whispering about it. Okay, so uh, Team North, what is the significance of the small pupil and the droopy lid that the ER dot? Ear horners. So there's a right-sided horners. Okay. Uh, team South, does this go together? The, so the ER doc does just like um, gross... <laughs> confrontation visual fields, and there's a left hemianopia, and they've got a right MCA stroke. Does that hang together? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the stroke is on the opposite side of the hemianopia, so that hangs together. Um, patients with um, left hemianopias are, can sometimes have neglect, right? They don't realize that they have a left hemianopia, and that's why he... <laughs> still went out and drove his car, right? Because he didn't know, any, he really didn't know anything was wrong. And also, the other thing that's weird about this case is this guy's 44. Like, that's not your typical stroke patient. I mean, it happens, but it's not your typical patient. Okay, so then, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Jeff. Jeff, so I heard you mumbling about a dissection. Yeah, which is exactly right. So if you have a right-sided dissection, that's going to give you a right-sided stroke, remember, because the carotid artery supplies the middle cerebral artery. It's going to give you a right-sided horners, and if you have bad luck, you're going to get a left hemianopia. Yeah. So this is somebody who had a somehow dissected their right carotid artery. That's a, that is a thing, that's a stroke thing in 44-year-olds, uh, as opposed to like the usual smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Chiropractor. Chiro yeah, chiropractor could do it, sure. Or a um, wrestling with your grandkids <laughs> on the on, on the floor, um, uh, roller coaster rides, um, uh, car accident, you know, just like a fender bender with a whiplash injury. You know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. depending on how, which way you twist your neck, it, it doesn't have to take a lot of force to dissect your carotid artery, especially if you've got something like fibromuscular dysplasia or some other, you know, innate weakness in the muscular uh, part of your artery wall. Um, I do have two more cases, but it's late, so let's get to where we need to be at 8 o'clock. Okay.